as I'm the chairman of the committee this evening. Um, welcome everybody to Audit and Governments Committee tonight. Um, once again, we're online. Um, papers <coughs> published on the Council's website in the Modern Government app, and these papers will be considered by members. Um, members attending this evening will be asked to be introduced themselves shortly. This will we, we ensure that they're all in attendance as expected, and they can hear and speak to the meeting, and also for the benefit of the public. Um, this committee rarely requires formal votes, but if necessary, we'll ask members individually to, um, at the end of the debate whether they're for or against or wish to abstain from the recommendation before them at the stage. I don't think we have any votes this evening. Um, when it comes to simply noting report, we just ask them, uh, ourselves to agree. Uh, when not speaking, please could you put your microphones on mute and when called to speak, obviously allow um, your uh, unmute allow yourselves about three seconds before speaking. Um, it's helpful if people could indicate using the, um, the, the the chat bar if they want to speak. That said, we tend to try, I, mean, I think there's few enough of, of us, we try to just sort of let people speak just by putting your hand up and go. So um, we haven't got to be too formal about that. Um, and as ever, we're the mercy of individuals broadband, but as long as there are three of us in the meeting, we will be court. Um, I'll now do a roll call of councillors. And as I see your name, please introduce yourselves to the meeting. So I'm David Stevens, and I'm chairman of the Audit and Governance Committee. A committee. Um, alphabetically then, Councillor Davis, I can see him. Hello, I'm uh, Richard Davis, Councillor for Caversham Ward and Vice Chair of the Audit and Governance Committee. Very good, thank you. Um, Councillor Deborah Edwards. Oh, hi, I'm Councillor Debs Edwards, uh, Councillor at Southcote Ward. Good Councillor, evening. Hello, good evening. Councillor Ellie Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Good evening, Councillor Ellie Emerson, and I'm the lead councillor for Corporate and Consumer Services. Um, well, I haven't seen him, I'm afraid. Councillor Paul Gittings. Paul, Git Councillor Gittings said he might be slightly late, but he is there, Okay, so hope to hear George. Councillor McKenna, and I believe this might be your swan song of this committee this evening. It is after five years. Yeah. Councillor Emmett McKenna, Chair of Planning Applications Committee and Whitley Ward Councillor. Right. Thankfully, we've got the one item for you, which is the um, audit actions update. So we'll, we'll let you have a good old sort of slot around in that. For, uh, as you know, That'll do. Uh, and all of the audits as well. Can't yeah. forget those. Very good. Um, Councillor Simon Robinson. <clears throat> good evening, Chair. Good, in good evening, everyone. I'm Councillor Simon Robinson representing Papard Ward. But I think, David, you've missed out Councillor Page. If no, you I haven't. Been no, 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 it's all right. Um, Councillor Josh Williams. Oh, good evening, Chair. Yeah, Josh Williams, Park Ward. Thank you very much, Councillor Williams. So those are all the, the members of the committee. In addition, um, Councillor Page is here to observe um, and make sure we all behave, we behave ourselves. And we've also got a couple of officers present. Um, um, uh, I say Councillor, but Mrs Yates, who's obviously our Director of Resources, but also particularly like to welcome, oh, sorry, we've got Michael Graham, who's here as, um, as General Counsel. Um, we've got Michael Popham, who is taking the minutes this evening, but also I was very keen to introduce to everybody, if they haven't met him already, um, Darren Carter, who is our new Director of Finance, Section 151 officer. Darren, would you briefly like to just introduce yourself? Because obviously I've met you because I was on the panel that interviewed you, but most haven't. So would you like to say hello to everybody and uh, tell yep, them where you hello. come from and what you do? Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Darren Carter. I'm Reading's new Director of Finance. This is week four in the role uh, for me, and I'm loving it so far. So, uh, yeah, uh, nice to meet you all. And, uh, yep, if you've got any questions for me, feel free to ask. Very good. And I can see a couple of other people as well. I can see Annette here, and I think I also saw, um, I've lost the name, that um, Whitney Pump as well, a couple of people in attendance. Um, okay, so we go to um, agenda, and the first item is declarations of interest. So does anybody have any interest they wish to declare? I'm not hearing anybody. Okay, so none. Great. Minutes of the last meeting, I have looked through them. They seem to me a fair record or true record of what we discussed. Is everybody else happy to approve those? I see heads nodding, so we all got that as approved. Um, question, all right, next, um, item three are questions. We've had one question received from a member of the public, um, a Mr. Wellam. Um, so, Michael Popham, have we got um, connected up to Mr. Wellam? Sorry, Hold on. Uh, Sorry, oh, Chairman. I'm afraid I've just no, got a, right. a message from Mr. Wellham, who says, unfortunately, he's, he's um, dislocated his thumb and he's in the A&E, so he won't be joining us today. Um, 
So um, we'll have to move on from questions. He's, been re he's received the response from you anyway. Um, so we'll just record it as being um, sent through in the sort of way just by um, paper copy. That's a shame. We never get questions. Chairman? Oh no, Kaza Stevens is as proud. Vice Chair? It's, it's incumbent on me at this point to move on in the agenda, which I don't have. Uh, yes, I do. I do have. Um, it would be the Internal Audit Quarterly Progress Report, if you were uh, mind. Let me see. Questions, yes. Yeah. Mm. Item four, Internal Audit Quarterly uh, Progress Report. Um, which officer is bringing that one? It's um, uh, Paul Harrington. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, OK, so this is, this is my usual update reports covering those audits completed in quarter four of this financial year. Now, I'd usually work on the assumption that the whole report's been read, but there's a there's a lot to read. Um, there's a lot of appendices, so I want to quickly do um, a very brief summary of, of the audits we've we've we've, we've completed, and at the end, I'll obviously take any questions. So the total of the six audit reviews have been finalised in the period between January and March. Three received a positive assurance opinion, and three received a negative assurance opinion. Attached to Appendix One, which is on page thirteen is the main summary report. So in terms of uh, first one, payroll, that was a positive opinion. In general, we concluded the payroll system is well run and is functioning effectively despite the strain that's been placed on um, payroll staff to process furlough payments. Next one on the list is penalty charge notices, um, which was given limited assurance. Um, th this is um, a, a part two report on tonight's agenda. Um, but the um, what we ha are saying is penalty charge notices are pursued for enforcement to the end of their life as per statutory processes. But the concern we had as, in, as um, auditors is how non-payment, that's debt, is formally written off and recorded. But as I say, that um, the full order report is on part two of tonight's agenda. Uh, next one on the list is additional payments. So this covers acting up allowances, honorariums, overtime, market supplements, etc. Found really, really good pro, uh, uh, progress has been made in implementing audit recommendations. This was given limited assurance about two years ago. So there's been really, really good progress. So again, um, that's a positive area. Next one is housing revenue accounts. So we had concerns in this area. This flagged up several areas. Um, where improvement is needed, uh, with one of the key areas being the over-reliance on external um, support and lack of specialist HRA expertise within the finance function um, to ensure that service teams are fully supported in their roles in relation to the HRA. So that was given limited assurance. Um, the last limited assurance is accounts receivable, which is one of the key financial systems. So this is debtors. Now, this audit looked at the end-to-end -end process. So the the concerns of the issues aren't in the debtor system per se. It's more the end-to-end -end process. So let's, let's look at Saundry debt and adult social care debt. And whilst there has been progress in implementing audit recommendations, and there's still a lot of work to be done. Now, you have to remember that an audit is a snapshot moment in time. This audit was completed around about the beginning of this calendar year and I already know now we're in the middle of April and a lot of these um, issues are being addressed and will be addressed and um, as of today I've been told that the the um, where it currently sits on Academy will be moving over to Fusion from the beginning of May and um, I think that really will Im improve the, um, the process. Last one, um, accounts payable. Now this is a, a positive news because we've been given accounts accounts payable limited assurance for as long as I can remember. And there's been this year significant progress has been made on implementing outstanding audit recommendations. So there's now a complete set of procedures for the AP function. Um, significant workers and resources have been committed to addressing issues with the supplier database. 
And as a result, there are processes and staff resource within procurement to set up supplies and deal with change of circumstances. So this promotes a greater separation of duties between supplier setup and payments. For the period April to December 20, so that's that, that, they're the transactions we audited, the vast majority of payments took place within 30 days. So that's a vast improvement from where we were um, a couple of years ago. And that is also in the middle of a, of a, of a COVID-19 pandemic. So um, again, that's really, really good. And another area of positive progress is reduction in the number of payments on hold, which has declined significantly since the last audit took place. And in addition, considerable effort has been made to reduce the number of suppliers with regular reviews of um, inactive suppliers. So again, that, that's really, really good news. And I just wanted to, um, to, 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 to touch upon that. So in, on page 21, 22 of the report, there's a table which shows you the, the audit plan. So it's actual performance against planned. We're on course to complete practically everything. There's a couple of audits which did get cancelled because of the services involvement um, in uh, COVID-19. So this is more sort of adult social care. Uh, and there's a couple of we, we will be are in the course of finalising now. So on the whole, we're gonna we we will complete the plan, which again um, for me uh, has been good. Um, section four on page 23 and 24 summarises the work of the um, corporate investigations team, and I'm asking that the um, the committee is requested to consider the report. OK, thank you very much. I'm back. I was obviously typically bounced after a key moment there, um, but I'm back with you. So hopefully it turns out once a day. So that's me now. Hopefully I have to the meeting. formally sorry? hand back over to you there, Chair. Oh, sorry, you took over, did you? Oh, thank you, Richard. Yes, sir, okay. yeah. I, I formally hand back over to you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so hopefully back with you. So I'm um, super. You just bounced um, forward to item five, which is great. So I guess any questions arising from those reports? Um, and we know, as you say, the penalty charging notice we're going to pick up aren't we in part two anyway and um, the rest of the that last one that's very encouraging isn't it that, that things have been finally improving after after quite a long time of effort to try to sort of improve that um richard you're indicating yeah i mean usually we uh we tend to skip over the positive ones don't we yeah. uh but uh it's great that uh mm. paul's, paul's felt uh felt moved to highlight some of the, the really good progress that has been um, so I just want to take for a second to note that. So that's yeah. uh, good news. Um, and uh, inevitably, in this in this committee, we focus on the you know, the, the, the the areas that need improvement. Just um, something that caught my eye was about the um, housing on the housing revenue account because I, I used to have more, much more involvement in that was as a lead councillor. Um, something you picked up on there was the the, the sort of need for specialist um, HRA accountants. And I think there was talk about getting someone in and then having to get a contractor in to mentor them and then maybe the, the contractor left. And are, are you are you happy that we're in a position now we've got someone who has got specialist knowledge or enough knowledge in HRA finance? Um, I can't really answer that question. I'd have to look to either um, Jackie or, or, or Darren to give an update on the current position. Yes, so I'm happy to pick that up. So yes, it's one of the issues that I'm looking at in terms of the skills and capacity on the team. One thing I can assure audit committee about though is that I personally have significant experience of dealing with housing and the HRA over the years. So actually I'm confident that the gap as detailed at the time of the audit no longer exists and we'll make sure that we've got the a spread of those skills across the team. One thing I want, I'm keen to avoid is just having single dependencies where we've got one person who's got that specialist knowledge. And if there's something happens to that person, suddenly we've got a gap on the team. So mm. I'm keen to make sure that we've got multiple people trained up with the skills to do it. But as I said, this is one area where I've got a lot of personal experience of dealing with the HRA and the modelling. So I'm confident that the gap has existed at the time of the audit no, is no longer there. Excellent. That's good to hear. Thank you. Um, Josh Williams, you, you want to speak? Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I made loads of notes on this and then I've broken my glasses today and I've taped them back up. With silly. <laughs> so I'm hoping I can read this. Um, Councillor Davis is absolutely right there to raise the positive. It's not just um, negatives that we learn from as an authority, I don't think. It's also the positives because we need to do more of those um, at the same time as fixing the negatives. 
I noticed in the report that there were only two officers in post in internal audit for most of this period. So um, I wanted to say thank you because um, it, it looks to me like a huge piece of work that goes on throughout. So, the sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So that two officers, that's the investigations team. So ah, OK. They've been, the audit team, they've been fully resourced this year. Right. So that was the investigations team. So I still like to thank those, uh, whoever those two officers are, because I don't know their names. Um, but thanks very much for bringing these reports. Um, a couple of questions. I'm trying. What I'm trying to do when I read through all these reports is link the the quarterly report to the finance improvement program to the recommendations tracker. And uh, given that I did break my glasses, I have struggled a little bit. Are the eleven recommendations from the accounts receivable section? Um, they're not in the recommendations tracker yet, but they would be for the next one. Just sort of, is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, because I was trying to find them, and then anyway, yeah, that explains it. And a second question, just a quick one, really. The the governance review, which is carried over to twenty one twenty two, has that been run in the relatively recent past? Is that is there one that I could look at to say what happened last time? Did it come up with any broad recommendations or? um any details yeah not to this this level of detail no not to the level of detail we're proposing to do okay cool so that'll be a relatively new report at that uh, granularity yeah okay i think that was it i just wanted to say thanks and make those comments thank you well done good i mean i've also likewise been impressed that you've actually managed to keep up with the program this year because you would imagine it being damn difficult um has actually working at home and just maybe off him actually made things easier in some ways getting access to people <laughs> yes and no um obviously um there are it issues um you've experienced yourself being kicked out of a meeting yep. uh, it happens <laughs> um but when you're working at home you actually you get more done and mm. you actually do more because there's less distractions that's what i'm personally finding and mm. i think that's what i'm finding with the team you can get hold of people easier Yep. Um, because you plonk in the meeting and then there's a, there's a team's meeting. But certainly, because there's less interruptions, we are getting more done. Things about auditing is you're examining a lot of information, a lot of data, and then you have to write a report. And that sometimes you just need that peace and quiet. You just need that yep. room to yep. yourself where you can do that. Sometimes in an open planned office, it takes that a little bit longer. Interesting. There's obviously, it's interesting that the director of resources is listening in, and uh, there's just definitely um, lessons for resourcing here. About, and I found I found also through business and this how, how punctual are people, people for meetings. We started a meeting on the hour, as, as we have this evening, everybody logs in on time, off, ready to go, until they get chucked out again. Um, no, that's interesting. Okay, so that's that's good. Um, okay, so that was item five. What happened to our Mr. Wellen, our caller? So Michael Poppin question. Sorry, Is Chairman. Okay? Yes, he's, um, he's um, yeah, dislocated his front thumb, so we won't be able to attend this evening. Um, right. So he's, um, so we moved on from the question. He's received the question. Um, it's been sent to him. So okay, yeah, the response. Him, he's got an answer, which you actually sent earlier, didn't you? So that's that's good. So okay, so for um, so we've done the question. We've done the internal audit um, progress report. Excellent. So then we go on to item five, I think, which is um, the annual audit plan and the internal audit charter, which is, if I can find it in my second screen, unless somebody else can get there first. Um, it's on page 63. Thank you. That's my one to. Not really at 63. No, uh, yes, it is. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so page 63. Okay. So Paul Hannigan, off we go. Yeah, so so this is um, each at the beginning of each year, we have to produce an audit plan, and that's put together through discussions with um, executive directors, assistant directors, and a lot of senior uh, manage, managers. I take it around to the director of management teams, and then it goes through to the um, to the corporate management team. And we do this by asking people, you know, what are the areas of concern? What are the things that keep you awake at night? Um, and we look at the strategic risks, we look at project risks, um, directorate risk registers, and from all that information, we compile an audit plan, and then I risk assess what I think we should, should be doing, what's more important than other areas, and, and what we actually can do. So it's my responsibility at the end of the year to provide um, an annual assurance opinion on the council's control environment. And in the context of 
our professional standards, which are the public sector internal audit standing, standards, opinion doesn't mean simply view, comment or observation. It means that internal audit have done sufficient evidence based work and achieving this by delivering this plan. Yeah, we, we, we will achieve achieve that. So the plan is, is in Appendix 1, um, which starts on page 67, and it really talks about why we do things, how we do it, uh, and, uh, and then how, how we um, complete individual audits. So that's all the background there. And the actual plan itself, in terms of the subject areas we're going to be reviewing, um, it starts on page 74 um, through to, I think, page 78, 79, uh, and they are the subject areas divvied up into into quarters um for, for the for the next financial year and um, and also attached is the um is the audit charter and it's seen as good practice to present this to the audit committee once a year and the audit charter sets out our purpose authority responsibility and scope of the audit team and again we take that to the um to, to the corporate management team and we take it to the um, audit committee for approval so I'm asking the, uh, the committee to approve the plan for the next financial year and um, the audit charter okay thank you very much for that that sounds just what we need I suppose one thought and I think I always tend to say this is you obviously went around as you say managers directors and get an input from them do we also get feelings from other authorities um, I think you're a, you're a member of I think an institute of internal auditors what else is around there so that we've got external views it's not just within the authority yeah, a lot of the um, the external audit bodies produce um, publications on what the um, what areas internal audit should be focused on, the emerging risks for the next twelve months. Yeah. And obviously, I have my local meetings, um, my Berkshire neighbours, London audit group, and again, uh, we compare plans and we compare areas. So, yeah. So I think that's really healthy that we get these, yeah, it's, it's not just within the, the borough. And I guess it's also, a, I'm going to one for Darren, I guess, again, you've come out with a fresh pair of eyes. It'd be very useful to you if you haven't already to look at it and um, any any thoughts you have will be um, obviously very useful to input those. Yeah, I will be happy to do that. The reports for this meeting, I have to say, were pretty much concluded before I started, but I'll make sure that I'll give Paul my full input into any reports for future meetings. Very good. Um, Josh Williams, you want to speak and then Richard Davis. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, as you say, another very welcome report. Just a quick question. So it, I really welcome the review of the climate change strategy and that's scheduled in for Q4 of 22. So I assume, um, rightly or wrongly, we, we might get a report this time next year, perhaps. Um, or, or would it even be later than that? Uh, my question is that doesn't um, that doesn't seem particularly urgent given that the council um, declared a climate emergency. Are there very good, sensible, practical reasons why it's in um, Q4 rather than um, bringing it earlier into the year? Yeah, um, I have to balance, you know, what resources I've got available and then other audits that I've got planned for Q1, Q2, Q3 and Q4. And it was felt that further work will have been done in time uh, by the end of the, this financial year. So quarter four um, was the um, agreed period that we um that we were asked to do the audit in. So that's why it's fallen in quarter four. Um, and in terms of will I be bringing that back to this time next year? Yes, possibly. If it's not the April meeting, it'll be the July meeting. OK, slightly out of sequence. Can I take Tony Page next? I think Tony probably want to respond on this particular point. Well, yes, I was going to raise a point in any case on this before Councillor Williams uh, spoke, but uh, um, I am uh, wanted to just pick up on his um, comment because the climate change strategy is a partnership document and my criticism of the note here under planned internal audit coverage is that it doesn't make that explicit that clearly any audit can only audit that for which the council is directly responsible um, there will be mischief makers i'm not suggesting there are any on the meeting this evening um, who will seek to attribute to the council failings of other organizations um, so i think that uh, I would seek reassurance from Mr Harrington that the audit will recognise that there are elements of the strategy which are the direct responsibility of the council, 
there are those that are shared and there are those that frankly the council has little control over other than the fact that we um, have uh, acted very much as the uh, uh, the facilitator in terms of resourcing and servicing uh, the strategy and bringing together many other partner organisations. But the successful delivery of the overall strategy will require uh, the engagement of the private and voluntary uh, sectors as well. And they clearly do fall outside uh, the audit responsibilities of Mr Harrington, unless I'm unaware of a change uh, that will thrust him into their organisations uh, as well. Um, and furthermore, I would just say through you, um, uh, Chair, to Councillor Williams, that elements of the climate change strategy will be monitored and reviewed by relevant committees throughout uh, the year. And some examples are given in the, uh, um, in the uh, uh, report uh, uh, this evening. Um, so I envisage very active commitment and delivery of our strategy uh, by the council. But I would just re seek reassurance um, uh, in response to uh, to that, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Perkins speaks. Actually, sort of there he's off mute now. Go on, do you have? And I've got one or two thoughts on this as well. Yeah, you're really. I can only audit what the council is responsible for, so I can't audit, audit other organisations. But um, this is just a very, very high level um, sort of draft, you know, coverage. The terms of reference for the actual audit will be firmed up in in due course, closer to the time. I think exactly exactly right. You'd obviously they say where there are dependencies, you can only do certain things. If other people have done made their contribution, then obviously then it's auditable. Or not. I suppose what you could a conclusion might be that the council has a particular role to coordinate something and hasn't done enough in that area having said it would do something and hasn't that that would be a reasonable conclusion but i think councillor page quite rightly you know, if somebody else is supposed to be doing something it's completely outside the ambit of, of your audit and you, you can't you know, really sort of take responsibility for that um okay so anyway, we, we take your point um, and concern the councillor page that's fair anybody else so we then back to um, richard william uh, richard davis sorry yeah, I mean, just just a, a, another thing on that on that point. I mean, the, the, usually we what we do is we audit controls, don't we? We we talk about controls really in this meeting. Um, I'm not sure it's our place to, to talk about whether you know the council has managed to reduce uh, Reading's overall uh, emissions of carbon dioxide by five percent or ten percent or whatever, because that's that's probably for other committees to do. Um, we we I guess. I, I, yeah, as 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 um, uh, Paul said, it's um, the exact terms of reference are yet to come out, but yeah. we don't we don't re you know on the whole we talk about not like you know has the council caught lots of people um, um, parking badly or something. It's more like do we know who is is, is parking you know uh, incurring PCNs? Have we chased them up properly? Is it, you know, it's it's our controls we talk about rather than implementation of policy on on the whole. We're interested to see. We're interested to see how yeah. that and um, what the terms of reference of those of that audit is, and I imagine later on we will see that. So that wasn't what I was going to say though. Um, the <laughs> uh, what I was going to say is that I noticed that the um, something that occurred to me was and uh, um, uh, was that um, the uh, in the in the the COVID um, pandemic and uh, uh, in response to that initially, the the government had all sorts of measures to mitigate that with. Um, things like um, uh, business rates relief, etc. And you know, I, I had had all the all the way along. I've been thinking that's a huge area where um, you know we, widespread fraud is, is is possible. And you know, whether it's possible, wherever it's possible, we're, we're likely to see some of it. And uh, that we would uh, this committee would need to react to that and make sure you know, come down hard on making sure that only the people who should get these uh, grants and, and loans, etc., uh, who qualify them for them properly, are getting them. And um, I'm really pleased, therefore, to see that you know Paul's had the same thoughts. And you know, in Q1, we've got uh, the business grants assurance audit. audit. Um, so you know, that's a, that's an uh, um, that's an example of us reacting to something that's out there in the real world and uh, uh, and uh, looking at it um, straight away. So that's welcome. Yeah. 
And just 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 to uh, add, add to that comment, throughout this uh, sorry the last financial year, 2021, the investigations team have been doing sample checks of of these grants awarded. So they have been doing checks, and they've they've checked well over a thousand um, payments in terms of numbers. Um, yes, and they have identified um, uh, just a handful of um, fraudulent applications. Mm. It's actually in the, in the report tonight, isn't it? it was, yeah. I think it was earlier on, wasn't it? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, Which good, actually good, is, good evidence of that. Yeah. It is remarkable because I think we understand that, that the essence of the whole thing was the government was trying to get money out to businesses quickly, fast, yeah. um, and not impede them. And so you have this difficult balance of trying to get the money out there with basically putting lots and lots of checks in place and making sure that obviously the money isn't pay, paid out fraudulently quite rightly. It's difficult to get that balance right. And, and if that's, the, that's the, the degree of it, that relatively few have been actually called. That's actually either they've been very good at the fraud or actually we, they haven't tried in the first place is what you hope or that we've actually picked them up where we're necessary. One, just one thought on Richard Davis's comment about auditing, which I think that's right, but don't forget the other half of our name is audit and governance. So we might conclude that say where we're acting in partnership with others or we have a kind of coordinating oversight role, we might say, have we exercised that governance oversight role as best we could or could we have done it differently? Um, so I wouldn't necessarily over focus just on process and process control, but also the the oversight governance aspect of, of what the firm, and what the firm, what the actual um, the authority does. Okay, any other comments, um, Emmett and McKenna? Um, so both yourself and Richard have touched on it, but I'll also draw people's attention to section four of the report, which is on resourcing, which demonstrates how efficiently the service is running keep bringing us these excellent reports and that just the usual request that if members of staff change with skills and experience and personnel that it flags up the committee because obviously the plan is a plan and is amended as needed. Thanks. Yeah, OK, very good. Yeah, and I think we we, all, we keep saying it, but I will carry on saying Mark, on behalf of the committee that we do thoroughly value what Paul's doing and um, yeah, you know, we couldn't frankly function without what you're doing, so it's it's really appreciated. Okay, so I think um, unless somebody else has, uh, um, I think that's the last one. Emmett McKenna was the last one to indicate. So with that, that was um, item five. So basically, we're being asked, I think, to approve it. Is that right? So if you're happy, hands or shout, I approve. Approve. We have got a jolly okay. good. So approve. Aye. <laughs> We've approved your um, annual plan, uh, Mr. Harrington. OK, so next is item six, which is the strategic re um, risk register. And I think you're also going to introduce that for us. Yes, yes. Thank you, Chair. So this report outlines the um, strategic risk register as at quarter four of the 2021 financial year. So these are the strategic risks identified and managed and owned by the um, corporate management team. Um, we've now put the um, strategic risks into the council's performance management system, which is in phase. So the report looks slightly different. Um, we we want to get to a position where we can just press a button and produce a report. We're not quite there yet. So there's been a little bit of um, editing to, to get it into a into a report format. But as I say, the, the strategic risk which just starts from page 95. Um, at the top, it would tell you what the risk is, the risk owner. Then you have the, the, the top line, which is the unmitigated risk. So this is the worst case scenario, the do nothing scenario. Then you have the residual risk, which is the middle line. So that's um, taken into consideration and the mitigating ap action. And the bottom line is the appetite, where we would ideally like it um, to be. And then the RAG uh, rating is the difference between the um, risk appetite and the residual risk. And then at the bottom of, of, of each risk, you will see the current actions and update. And these are very, very high level bullet points in terms yeah. of um, mitigating action. So. Um, yeah, that's it from me. I'm just asking the committee to um to note the strategic risk register. OK, and, and looking through it earlier, and I'm just flicking through it now. If I think I'm correct in saying just about in every case, it's either a flat line, i.e. the risk hasn't increased or in a number of cases, actually it's improved um, unless you say to the contrary, which is great, which is what we want, of course. Um, so my observation is that you know the, the, the key risk remain identified that we've got effective actions or mitigation in place. And so 
it's as it's as best controlled as it can be, knowing what we know at the moment, is my observation. Um, Emmett McKenna, do you want to come in? You're on mute. No, I wasn't indicating. Oh, that was in the room next to the last of item, was it? Sorry, I kind of like this was the last comment. Apologies. Anybody else wants to comment on this? Uh, Richard probably, Davis, you can. Probably you shouldn't draw attention to it, but it's um, risk 13, I think, was the only one, which is about cyber attacks, was the only one that uh, was uh, was increasing, right. I think. And probably, I think that's wise. The cyber attacks are, in, are, are increasing in risk. Um, we just have to make sure we increase our mitigation in line with that, isn't it? Has everyone done their training? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Brilliant. Which actually, yes, that's a good point. You up. <laughs> we won't embarrass anybody here, but I think it's probably, I, I've said to my our group, that absolutely vital that all councillors do it. I think it's mandatory for all members of staff. And I think we can't look calf in the eye and say, well, you've got to do it, but it's nice for us to do if we like to. I feel that we all should do it. And I pressed upon our group that they should. Hopefully everyone in this committee has, has done it. Um, it's, it's, it's important. Councillor Emerson nodding in agreement, which is very reassuring. Yeah. No, thanks to you, Chair. I know you've done a lot of whipping in your group and likewise, we've done the same. So I think the numbers are much improved. Yeah, we said we said in our group, either you do it or you leave, and we've got one that left. And I think you've had the same problem with a couple of yours, haven't you? Just... <laughs> couldn't, get, couldn't get Tony Jones to do it. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we just note this. So again, unless there's any dissent, um, we note and thank you for that. So the next one, oh, it is, all right. it is coming up is a seven, which is the um, financial improvement program, which is why Chris Tidwell suddenly appeared on my screen. That explains it. You introduce it. <laughs> okay, lead us uh, away. Thank you, Chair. I was paying attention, obviously. Then, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is the, um, the the quarterly update on the finance and improvement program. Uh, the first part of the report is just a background, uh, which talks about the the phase one of change and transformation. Uh, and the work streams. Uh, some things to highlight, uh, three of the work streams now are in the final stage as accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, and the residual tasks within those are more or less around creating the monitoring environment afterwards. Uh, there's some detail further down, um, and then those will be completed. Certainly those three will be completed by the end of April. The longer term um, work stream is around the finance system replacement, which has a target date of the end of December, so that's not not changed. Uh, and the other thing that the report also includes is referencing the audit tracker. So where though where there are references to those work streams, I've highlighted those as well. And you'll see from the paper that uh, at the last report we had 60 audit recommendations in the tracker that related to the program. That's now down to 43, and of that 43, 20 are green. So following their approval, they'll be removed as well. So there's been great progress on the audit tracker recommendations, as well as delivery against um, the individual work stream deliverables. Uh, just a couple of other things to mention, and, and just to give you some scale, really, if we talk about accounts payable, we have a, a lot of suppliers that have, have caused a headache, the number of them, the volume of them, uh, and the team have reduced that from 16,000 supplier sites down to 7,000. So somebody's actually gone through and, and kind of reviewed them all, reduced them all, and that introduces an element of efficiency in terms of the yeah. process and also also reduces risk. Uh, and we've done the same thing around the chart of accounts, um, which is something that's the heart of every accountant's life within the, within local authority. There were 1,100 um, um, account and centre codes or objective subjective codes, which I do really want to describe, and they've been reduced to 800, which again improves the amount of control, improves the accounting arrangement. So there are some real, really important metrics in terms of the achievement of these work streams and the way that that works. So I'm quite happy to take any questions as detailed in, in the paper itself around the individual recommendations and how they've moved, uh, moving from completion um, or rather moving from not started through to completion, which have all been positive. So I'm, I'm qu quite happy to take any questions, Chair. OK, um, thank you very much for that. And I think yes, it is easy to underestimate quite how much effort's gone into getting this 
um, in, a, in a sensible, correct place. So what we're hoping, of course, is that by completing all this work, the the 2021 accounts hopefully will be in good order um, and in a much better state, ready to go for um, to external audit. Um, okay, Josh Williams. Thank you again, Chair. Um, yeah, this finance improvement programme seems like the most fundamentally important thing on this agenda, I think, because it's really turning around um, uh, a situation which had become poor into one which will be good. And just a quick question so that I can again link up these reports. The um, I think I think you just said the accounts receivable sort of uh, area is reaching its final stages. Um, the 11 additional audit rec internal audit recommendations that are coming down the line from the report we read earlier. Um, given that it's now in its final stages, presumably they're all pretty much covered off already. Is that a fair assumption? So in fact, when they go on the next um, recommendations tracker, they'll nearly all be uh, green or closed off or almost closed off. Is that is that fair to say? It, it does depend on the timing of the recommendations appearing on the audit tracker, but certainly for the ones I've got at the moment, we've got um, four that are amber um, and any that are green will be removed. But well, they are go. linked together. This, once they appear on the tracker, then they go into the implementation programme. So there is an ongoing process of, of improvement. Uh, and as I mentioned before, one of the things we want to make sure is that there is that cycle of continuous improvement. So anything that is picked up will then be will then be considered by that improvement programme as well. Perfect. So um, I guess what I'm getting at is we the internal audit found 11 new recommendations, but in fact, the improvement programme is nearly in its last stages for accounts receivable. So probably they're all covered off already. And those um, recommendations were made a little time ago as your work has been being done. Or have I got the wrong end of the stick? Chair, is it helpful if I if I come in just to clarify? Please do. Um, so, so the improvement programme was put in at, at a point in time with a number of historic recommendations. Mm. As Councillor Williams has rightly identified, um, there has been a recent report um, that Mr Harrington has, has presented this evening. Um, and again, um, Paul indicated that um, with the, the migration uh, to from Academy to Oracle Fusion will significantly help um, and that it will address certain of the recommendations in that report. But there are other recommendations that relate to the way um, debt is managed in at the front end in service areas rather than in in the corporate finance centre, if you like, mm -hmm. and the accounts receivable transformation programme when it was set up was not to look at those. It was to look at the internal corporate finance processes particularly. That doesn't mean the recommendations won't get picked up. Um, they will go on the tracker and we will track them, but they are not an intrinsic part of that particular work stream. Mm. Perfect, thank you. Could I ask, I think it's a similar question in a slightly different way, which obviously the, the focus completely correct has been on these major systems and getting this right. Um, is somebody at the same time casting an eyes out more widely so we don't effectively win the last war or the current war and then suddenly discover they've got fires have suddenly started blowing up all over, uh, elsewhere. We miss them because we've been focusing on this. So I guess we've got other people looking out at other other potentially arising or potential art issues. So, so <laughs> very, very, very layman terms. So, so chair, if if I may, um, and um, I, d I don't want to steal Darren's thunder here, but I have been chairing the transformation board, so it might help if I just um, reference a meeting we had today. Um, which was talking about the accounts payable side of life. And if I use that by way of example, so in terms of the terms of reference for that initial work strand, we have effectively completed that now. And what we were talking about today was needing to put arrangements in place whereby um, we agree the metrics that we are going to be tracking um, the accounts payable performance going forward, 
the reviewing of the documentation that we've taken a, a huge amount of time to pull together to make sure that doesn't get out of date and also um, looking about how we put some extra controls in um, around the fraud implications in the supplier setup process. None of that was part of the original work strand, but it was all things that the board collectively felt um, in terms of continuous improvement was the yep. right thing to do to take things on to the next level. And Darren will be picking this up with, with the team moving forward. Well, that's great. So that's a reassuring and that I think responds to, to what I was alluding to there. Um, Emmett McKenna. So from my point of view, it might be helpful to draw members back to the audit plan where in quarter two we'll be looking at accounts receivable and quarter three payable which will look at the effectiveness of this initial phase of the transformation plan and then allow them to inform on phase two and that continuous improvement to say what's gone well of the improvement plan and what goes what needs further work thanks i have read the papers <laughs> <laughs> um but there's a really, it's a very positive story, which is exactly where we're, where we're doing this, of course. I mean, it's just, I'll just create briefly, Chris, as well. You said, was it 13,000 different suppliers? I mean, can you just briefly explain how the hell we have so many and how do we get from 13 now to seven? It's the range of suppliers. So you can have individual people who yeah, might be classed as a supplier if it's in adult yeah. social care. Yeah. Um, and then we had a, a, a situation where someone would uh, want to purchase something and would create a new supplier rather than finding an existing one. So it, it's kind of what we've been able to do is create a control structure so that that can't happen. So it narrows down. So rather than everybody just going and creating an account or using a new supplier, we're actually yeah. using existing ones. So being able to to trim those down and remove the ones that aren't needed has, has helped. Um, to get us that number down from 16 down to 7,000. So I imagine that, that that has far greater, well, at least 30,000, far greater potential for fraud, whereas reducing it and having trusted suppliers, hopefully that, that risk is reduced at the same time. It, it can also have an implication when you rationalise suppliers on where you spend and how you spend as well, and yep. the understanding around that, which is, uh, which is also important. OK, well, that's all very pleasing to hear that's happening. And I think so if it must be reassuring for Darren to hear that that's happening as well, um, as, 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 you know, a rise on watch. Um, OK, anybody else that wants to comment on item seven? See nobody indicating. So I think we just note that one. So noted. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay. Item eight is the information governance quarterly update. And, um, and Mike Graham's going to introduce that to us. Thanks, right. Jane. And uh, this is our second um, report then to give some uh, updates on information governance. So notable things to pick out from the report this time are in relation to FOI cases, the case management system, which had been um, in the offing for quite some time, has now finally been implemented and that went relatively smoothly. Training was delivered for officers. Of course, there are some inevitable teething troubles with people and not understanding how the system works. But initial signs look um, good for that. And it means now that we've got the opportunity to centralise the whole process through the customer relations team and get much better control over it. One of the features of the system is that we're going to be able to build up those stock of um, frequently asked questions on the website. So we'll be yes. able to divert people away from and asking FOIs if the information has already been provided in the past. So we'll look forward to that building up over time as they, as they come through. It'll be that, that that library builds up, so it won't be there immediately. So one of the other things to point out, we had a, uh, a planned phishing exercise, um, which was very, very interesting to see how that um, went. The, I wouldn't go into the detail about it in, in this report, but suffice it to say, it was of value to find out just how many people um, noticed it or reacted to it and it's something which we have got in mind to be to repeat again and to link this through to another point and on which is um, slightly later in the report it's part and parcel of um, a review of the whole information security policy which has come to the information governance board 
which we'll be working on and then developing an action plan uh, in relation to information security. Mm. In the next quarter, we are pretty much going to be looking at the review which we've commissioned. The, this was mentioned last time about a peer review, and we've managed to secure services from uh, Leicester City Council, who've got a notable training and um, development activity around this because they've got a long standing function, very well developed and mature, and they've given us a very good um, deal to look at uh, a sort of a consensual audit that the ICO might do if they were called in to the to the council to look at any particular issues. So they're interviewing a wide range of senior officers. We're going to be conducting a staff survey as well, and they're going to be looking at a wide range of um, policies and procedures, and that work's already started. So by the next meeting, you should have some feedback from them about what they're what they're saying about our, our arrangements. We've got, um, as Ollie mentioned, um, work on do underway in the board looking at the information security policy. And what I'd hope to do as we move towards the next quarter is to look at some of the actions coming out of that, some of the actions coming out of the review from uh, Leicester City Council, and some of the actions which are important to us in our draft strategy, and start to report back to you in less of a narrative style and more of a, an action plan format, which you can then uh, members of this committee tailor to what you think is important for you to keep track of. So uh, we'll develop it and iterate it over a, a couple of meetings mm -hmm. to see what the style you think is most important to you. But I think there's some of the some of the numbers which are coming forward that we've mentioned, for instance, in this report about tracking the number of people who have conducted their cyber security training is actually more important to keep a sort of constant vigil on. Yeah. You'll see that we've got um, good progress on the councillor side of the training. Um, congratulations to those of you who have done that. Um, the officers can't be, uh, can't brag as much because we've only had a slight increase in the number of officers doing it. But we have got, um, we have got some actions in hand to look at increasing that, including the reporting for managers through our iTrend for staff to make sure we've got the information for managers to know who has and who hasn't done the training in which team bringing that information back through the Information Governance Board so we've got a better awareness and ensuring that we can also try and link that information through to our performance management system, which you've already heard mention of in phase to make sure we've got a live overview about how we're progressing on that. Right. So, so Michael, just, just pause them and just I think it's worth just, just showing those figures. So you're saying at January meeting, that's four, just four months ago, 13% of councillors have done it, now 52% have which is a good improvement. And we're talking about when you say officers, 606, 29%, and that's increased to 33. Yeah. That's still quite poor, I would say, because I believe it's mandatory. Yes, it's something which we've pushed out and um, we've given high profile through the chief executive's um, newsletter. The mandatory element of it is something which we need to follow up on to make sure that it is actually being done because we can give the communication it's mandatory, but we haven't got the process actually nailed down about how we're following up to, to check it. So the best way of doing it is through the appraisal records where we record such things as health and safety training. And what we'd like to do is to get other other elements of training on there as well to be recognised yes. as people have done it. Well, I think the message from this committee would be that um, if something's mandatory, then it has to happen and we would be it's not acceptable to sort of uh, say anything to heart just not to do it at all levels. I mean, ditto councillors, I think, because it's it's the one of the ways we can try and protect ourselves. Um, and as you say, it's quite interesting, the fishing, you know, the effect of that and who, who then sort of falls for it. So I would say from our, from our committee that we would strongly support that and we would want to know, I don't know how, what mechanism we want, but I think at the year end, whenever we go for that. We would want to know, you know who isn't up to training and what excuses or reasons they have for not doing it. Mm. Um, it, it seems to me it's not good enough just to say you know, there, there, are, there are excuses if it's something's mandatory. No, totally agree. Yeah. Okay. And, any other comments? Sorry, I, I, I interrupted. No, you. I pretty much got to the end on that one. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other comments from members of the committee? Just, just very briefly, just um, I think the um, uh, freedom of information responses is something that people out there really do keep an eye on, and 
uh, it does get it does get attention from people. So it's good that there's there's a there's a report um, there's a report coming on that soon, yeah. and uh, we will expect to see. Yeah, well, hope hope to see as a result of this. Hope to see uh, some improvement. I think there's been something some press about it. Yeah. Um, even, even now. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, we'll look out for that. Thanks. We, yeah, we have had a follow-up FOI to our um, response rate on FOIs. So yeah. Yeah, people are watching. Yeah. And it's important yeah. to, that yeah. we can be able to to say that we, you know, not only did we spot it in 1920 and put some actions into place, but now that those actions have taken place, um, they've got to be bearing fruit. And if they're not bearing fruit, then you've know, got to ask ourselves, you know, why? Mm. Yeah. But my understanding listening to you is the, the aspiration is that we have largely self-service so that if they go in and they search on a particular word or something they could probably get there the information they want um, either there or on frequently asked questions where we get the same um, we get the, um, the right answers to them without constantly asking officers to prepare a response yes and what will be measured on of course is those people who come through when they ask a question the 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 real metric of it is do they get their answer within the 20 days or do they have to wait beyond the 20 days? So good, you know, good practice here for the Information Commission is about 90% within the 20 days. Um, you know, the people who are helping us out at Leicester City Council have got theirs above 90. Now, would really like to learn what they're, you know, a bit from them in their review about, you know, where, where they think that we can do better. And mm. that's part of practical arrangements of choosing another local authority um, and not uh, and not a private practice to give us that input in terms of those public sector functions and how we can actually respond to those and, um, and, and raise ourselves up from where we currently are in terms of our performance. It strikes me, you know, just, it strikes me on that, it's um, the, the problem, one of the problems is it's a sort of open door and it, you can't control what comes in through the door, can you, you know, uh, and from some of the FOIs I've seen it's often journalists wanting to you know collecting stuff on uh, information on national scales mm. uh sending fois out you know hundreds of fois to local authorities and you can't you can't necessarily control that so it's a sort of you know yeah it's um it's it's a tough one the challenge for us you're up you're, you're right we do get um people who uh, are using the system in order to find uh information for stories on a national level we've also got people who have got you know, valid interests on local issues they want to follow up. And I think that what we can do is look at the data transparency issues which we've got, which again, are actions are in hand to improve those, improve the information which we've got on our website. So if we understand that people are asking us questions to make sure that we've got those data sets and we can actually direct them towards the website so that we're publishing them regularly, and then the, the the request can simply be answered with, please see the link on the website because that's it's all there for you, and that is that is that has always been the best advice and guidance from the Information Commissioner's Office is to do that and to make more information available as much as you can. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Just one moment. I'm just doing something. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you don't need me to step in again. No, no, I'm with it. I just wanted to send something to Mr. Graham, actually. Um, so I think with that, um, I think we've got any other questions. Um, we will thank Mr. Graham for his report and note that. And I'll say particularly, I think the feedback from us is sort of um, um, really getting that, that level of training embedded it should become something everybody just accepts they have to do and do it um in good time okay yes so thank you yeah, yeah. um so then we move on to um huh, item I just got, item nine isn't it closing financial um accounts update so this is darren to introduce Yes, it is. Um, so this report provides an update on the progress made on the closure of the financial accounts. Substantial progress has now been made in relation to the audit of the 1819 accounts, and we're hopeful that the detailed audit work will be completed this month and that EY can then undertake their internal quality assurance reviews next month. So it'll be at that point that we know the outcome of the 1819 audit. 
Uh, I do want to provide assurance to members, though, that a huge amount of effort is going in to making sure that this process is completed as soon as possible. Um, and I should also remind everybody that if we do actually achieve these uh, timescales, um, then it will rep represent a significant improvement on the time taken to complete previous audits. Once the 1819 audit is completed, we'll need to undertake to update the work that has already been done on the 1920 accounts with the intention of completing that work by the end of July so that EY can then commence their audit work during August. Now, we're also intending to uh, do a parallel uh, production of the 2020-21 accounts uh, alongside the 1920. Now, the aim is that we're hoping to have both years audits completed by the end of this calendar year. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. OK, so we've obviously read the report as well. That's all very encouraging that it's now getting to a much better place. Yeah, um, and that's what we hope for. And yeah, that's what we want. So I, I haven't anything from me. Anybody else wants to comment on this? Jackie Yates. No, oh, sorry, you've suddenly appeared on my screen and unmuted. I thought it was <laughs> a bit of a fanfare, a bit of a drama. OK, no, nothing from Mrs Yates. Um, then I'll come in yeah. and say yeah. thank you to officers to finally yes. getting to the end of this story. <laughs> it's as it's my yeah. last meeting, I'll congratulate <laughs> you in advance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank because you. it is steady progress. I'm pleased with a happier story. I trust Darren will take all the credit now. Oh, well, only if it works. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, he, he, he wasn't born yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> when, not if. When, <laughs> when, when yeah. it works, when it works. Sorry. Nah. OK, so thank you very much for that. So we note that one. Um, and then item 10, implementation of audit recommendations tracker. So again, this is Councillor McKenna's uh, final blast. <laughs> this is Jake, we're going to introduce. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, you'll be aware, I mean, this is this is a regular report at Audit and Governance Committees now. Um, the purpose of it is to focus attention on progress with the implementation of uh, internal audit recommendations, as you know, um, and um, the format is, is as it's appeared previously. Um, paragraph 4.3, of um, sorry, 4.2 of the report sets out that um, since the last meeting, 17 new recommendations have been added um, and 33, which were previously reported as completed, have been removed from the appendix one. Um, and then at paragraph 4.7, that sets out in summary terms the RAG rating of the uh, 122, I think it is, uh, recommendations that are in, in that appendix. Um, I'm happy to take questions if I am able. Yeah. Okay, Councillor McKenna, all yours. So again, it's a more pleasing story. We've got to a reduction in the red, which shows that actions are at least being started at the time. And then there's just the usual story of some of them have been around for a while. I'm very happy to see the 33 gone and the large number of the 20, which are related to those financial systems, which show the progress there. And related to that, which I've already raised and don't expect an answer tonight with Darren starting so early is on audit eight, which is the SLA with legal, which I'm assuming that there should be a more positive story to next time. Once officers have had a chance to get to grips with it. Yeah, I mean, I can assure you that uh, legal officers are involved in that work. Mm. We haven't got an SLA in place yet, but me and Mike will be working on it. But legal are definitely supporting the process it was just more to get that process more formalized and yeah. understood because yeah. then it's also the transfer of skills and knowledge so that officers that are raising the debts have an understanding of the legal process for recovery 
Yeah. So that you can share best practice. Yeah. Yep. And then explain the issues that if legal officers get to the story at the end, if it hasn't been raised properly in the first place, what is your critical information? Yeah. Well, also as part of the review, are we putting in the right information? If it's overloaded with inadequate information, there's not really. But yeah. that's part of the financial improvement plan, and that's why I wasn't stressing. Yeah. OK, thank you, though. Yes, definitely. Um, Josh Williams. Thank you, Chair. I think I'm going to display some ignorance now, but I, um, I think this is a really valuable list. Councillor McKenna has always shown that it does have value. Um, what I was hoping to do was get the broader picture, you know, when we see the reds go down, the ambers increase, the greens, etc. Because I think that's of value as well, that broad picture. And so I looked again at the reasons why things are rag rated in that way. And one of them is that if they have, um, if they are less than 50% complete, but have exceeded their agreed completion date, then they become red. Where do I find the agreed completion date in this um, data set? Because at the top I've got uh, the year it was raised, the first follow up date. Um, but I'm not sure, does the agreed completion date go in there? The, the um, original agreed, sorry, I haven't got um, column numbers um, <laughs> on the tracker. Yeah, um, it's not easy to read, so. It's, um, there is the original completion date, and then if there's been a follow-up, mm -hmm. um, that date goes in as well. Um, but in terms of the, the narrative, very often um, officers will put um, a date in there if, if as to when they expect to complete it. But in terms of elapsed time, the the original date um, is is documented. Yeah. Yeah. I won't be able to see the agreed completion date unless it's noted in the narrative. I, I think, sorry, Councillor Williams, I think if you look at the first column, which is, I know it's really, really difficult to, to see, where it says first follow-up date. Yep. Um, to the left of that, you've got original audit completion date. That is the date we would have expected the recommendation to have been implemented by. The original audit completion date, right. Okay, yep. that is the agreed. Okay, perfect. Yep. Yeah. Um, I will use it as such and have another look. Thank you. So, if if I could, so if I looked at number item number twenty two, are other members able to see this? I know it's a nightmare navigating, uh, you know, ad hoc. But number twenty two has an agreed completion date of twenty eighteen. Um, it's rated twenty six to fifty, but amber. So I guess I would have expected something agreed to be completed in eighteen rated as red but have i misunderstood isn't that the date of the audit original audit yeah. that that's the yeah but josh is on to the point isn't it that's what that was as we understand it that's right so it should have been completed then yeah, you want the date you want the date after that don't you huh? Yes, so, so the, the, the original completion date um, is, um, sorry, I, I'm having trouble with my um, iPad. We were looking at number 22, was that the right one? It's yeah. just an example, I think there are okay. others. Yeah, um, so, so certainly that was the original completion date. Um, there, there are um, some mitigating circumstances um, in terms of um, the responsible officer around this has been um, off on long term sick and there hasn't been the cover in that area. So that date has gone, but you're right, you can't see that date in there. And, and it's because of those mitigating circumstances that have pushed that out that it's amber. Um, so yes i take the point you can't see from this that that revised date so that's something um i can pick up on 
perhaps there, there might be a general point here about just the clarity of the way it's presented because it's useful information it is good but it's obviously not entirely easy to read and likewise i, was, I had to go right to scroll to the very top page to get what, what the actual column headings and yeah. maybe given the fact you're doing this pdf format that perhaps just have a header repeat so that we can sort of <coughs> yeah to just, just to sort of assist um usability in terms of uh, us trying to read this on the screen at a, at, a, at a meeting like this. I think it'd be helpful. OK, any other comments on on this particular report? Good, well, I, mean, I think we'll pay credit to Councillor Kenner, who I think particularly has beaten the drum on this one over the sort of last number of years. So <laughs> I think I think what we've got here is a very useful report. I think, again, it's, it's it really it exposes it. it's the transparency, isn't it? And I think it's very helpful for officers and ourselves to sort of really see how it's progressing. So so thanks very much for taking the lead on that. Who are you passing the baton right. to? Well, I'll leave that up to councillors. But <laughs> at the same time, I'll pay tribute to Jackie that's actually created this report answering a previous concern that had been raised for a, a number of years with predecessors to actually get the transparency of the data so that the committee had the evidence to see where the progress was going. Yeah. And I think it's an extremely helpful document. Good. OK, well done for your contribution, both of you. OK, we're so we gonna... take... Sorry, somebody else? Yeah, sure, sure. we're not retiring this agenda number. Like, uh, I guess football shirts when a player leaves <laughs> you'd like this thing no. like in, in perpetuity yeah. be the Emmett McKenna to item to item <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. not a prayer counselor uh, I'm rugby we keep reusing numbers uh, yeah there's no room for sentiment in rugby is there um okay so we've done that as item 10 so then on item 11 um the external orders report it says if necessary but I'm guessing Adrian's still here so he might want to say something yeah, it was just really kind of to reiterate kind of the message that Darren had given in his report at Paper 9. So yeah. uh, significant progress has been made. So I think we've got another few weeks of the team trying to close out some of the areas that we're still working through. Uh, and then we'll move into kind of internal review and some of the processes through May. Um, I think the other thing I would like just to make note to the, to the committee is we've had really good engagement of senior officer level. So that's been weekly meetings all the way through from December. Um, which has really helped us kind of progress some of the issues where previously we might not have had that um, sort of focus and attention. So I think that's been really, really good to try and drive that through and has meant that we're in a good place to kind of get finished in a very timely way. The other thing I would say is there's been good focus in closing out the 18-19 issues. So obviously we're trying to run multiple years of accounts, but obviously a number of open imbalances are impacted by that. So I think just having that focus on the one year accounts to try and get to the point of moving on to the other years has actually been really, really good. Um, and I think the other thing is there's been good learning as well. So actually trying to kind of correct the issues in perpetuity as opposed to kind of having maybe a stick and plaster approach, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. But I think some of the bigger issues we've actually kind of managed to get really good kind of engagement with. And I think some of that will kind of come to fruit in the future years when actually we'll be able to kind of move through some of those uh, more technical and difficult areas in a more efficient way coming through towards the end of this calendar year, as Darren had already said. So as I said, happy to take any questions and anything that's kind of any members may have. But I think, as I said, it's good progress to kind of report. OK, well, thank you for that. And I mean, that's certainly for those of us who have been around for a while. We've noticed that, that dreadful turbulence we had for two or three years. And now I it's just so obvious that we're moving to a much calmer place, like the improvement programme, the where you've got to be working together and so on. It's all much, much steadier, which is, which is where we should be, frankly. OK, anybody else wants to comment on um, Adrian's um, input on the, on, on the um, whoops, sorry, um, audit report? No? OK, well, thank you very much for that. So I think at this point, um, I will say thank you very much to the committee that served over the year. Thank you very much, Emmett, so you're obviously leaving us. Um, we, the committee will obviously meet again the other side of the local elections, so hopefully anybody that's seeking re-election will to be back with us. Um, there could, of course, be a reshuffle anyway, and people might be appointed to different committees, so we might not have the same faces. But for those of you that uh, served all through the year, I hope you've enjoyed it, and thank you very much. Thank you for your contributions. Um, and we press again into, into the, the next year after May. So at this point, I think what we do is we all leave this meeting we were sent during the day um, an invitation um, from Michael Popham and we will rejoin that. And what will happen is that um, 
uh, and I'll just go through the formal language. I move that pursuant to section 100A of the Local Government Act 72 as amended, members of the press and public will be excluded during consideration of this one item on the agenda. So it's likely there'll be disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one, schedule 12A as amended of that act. Um, councillors, do you agree to that? You do. Agreed. So I will ask then, say thank you very much to members of the press, the public, um, Evelyn, apologies, I couldn't think of your name earlier, but you Whitney Pumps, representative. Um, so you're all leaving. Um, we are leaving as well, but then we'll be rejoining um, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully all rejoining a separate meeting. OK, thank you very much then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.